the Learn Africa Educational Development Foundation and the Fafungwa Education Foundation are collaborating on a series of interviews with stakeholders to explore issues of mother tongue literacy and improved educational outcomes. These conversations will look at the use of technology and mass media to advance the process. There's no better expert to begin this conversation than the great Kenyan writer, Ngugi Wationgo. Thank you and welcome. It's a delight uh, for me to have this conversation on the question of language, uh, not only in African literature, but language in African life. Uh, with the inimitable Ngugi Wathiango, uh, one of the world's most respected writers. Um, I call him Mwalimu, which means teacher, Ngugi. Mwalimu, it's a delight to welcome you to this conversation. Well, it's awesome. Nice meeting with you again. So what I like... Um, to where I would like to start is to invite you to uh, give a quick uh, overview of the evolution um, of your attitude on the question of language in Africa. Uh, uh, you started out your literary career, of course, writing in English uh, with Not Child, the River Between, uh, up till um, the magisterial A Grain of Wheat. Yeah. Um, at what at what point did your thinking on the question of language in African literature uh, change? The question of language in Africa, or the question of languages in Africa, has always disturbed me. And how do I know this? Because when I look back. And the journalistic articles that I used to write as a student for a Kenyan newspaper called the Daily Nation, in many of those pieces, I kept on refer referring to African languages and the need to use Kiswahili and African languages, you know. Uh, but really, the dramatic change for me uh, came in 19. Seven, uh, seven. I was then professor of literature at Nairobi University and chair of the department. At the same time, a number of us from the university, including Gogi Wa Merie, the late Gogi Wa Merie, uh, and uh, Dogi. Dr. Gishao, Paigua Chira, and others, you know, uh, started working with the peasants and workers of a village called Camredo. We called it Center Camredo Community Education and Cultural Center. And we produced a play in Igekoyo, Gaikadeda, in English, I'll marry when I want. And we wrote the play in Igekoyo because the community there was Igekoyo speaking community. Participants were workers in factories around, plantation workers, small farmers. So in anyway, we had to use the only language which they had, okay? That's why we wrote the play, I'll marry when I want, or Gaikadeda. But on November uh, 11, 1977, the play was stopped by the Kenyan government. And on December that first, same year, I was put in a maximum security prison, committed maximum 
security prison. It's a busy prison in Kenya. Uh, that was really a turning point because there I asked myself to, what, it's basically one question in various forms. It, and it was this, how come that an African government put me in a maximum security prison for writing a play in an African language? Yeah. Yeah. By comparison, I written very quite a number of novels which were critical of the post-colonial condition in Kenya, like say Petals of Blood, right? Uh, Michelle Mo and I had called that the play uh, The Trial of Lenny Kamadi, which again was very critical of the post-colonial condition. Why then did this particular play in the Koyo language, my mother tongue had me put in a maximum security prison. So two things. Um, that's when I started to think about the language question seriously. Yeah? And my thoughts were roughly like this. In every colonial situation, the colonizer always imposes their language on the colonized. And not only imposing, they, they glorify their language and then they uh, verify the language of the colonized. It happened in Ireland, right? It happened to Native Americans. It happened to Maori people. It happened all over the continent. Yeah. So the the the, the, the language of the colonizer uh, could only be developed, if you like, on the graveyard of the languages of the colonized. Okay. That's when I decided, at a personal level that I will no longer write my novels or dramas in English anymore. That would be right. I'm going to come back quickly to um, a point you just made, that, um, that colonial languages develop on the grave, uh, on the graves, basically, of uh, the, the languages of the colonized. Yeah. But let's mm -hmm. go back a little bit to when you were in school, when you started school as a young man in Kenya, in colonial uh, Kenya, uh, Kenya that was under uh, British rule. Yeah, uh, the British, Britain, it was it's what they call a, a British settler colony, yes. meaning there was quite settlement yes. in the country, yeah, yes. like South Africa, Tunisia, uh, or Zimbabwe. Yeah. Yeah. Unlike Algeria. Nigeria, where, where there wasn't yeah. much of that set Nigeria, up. Algeria. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so as a student uh, in Kenya, uh, through elementary school, uh, secondary school, and so on, and ultimately uh, your um, studies at Makarere University, uh, but I, I want to go back to your time as a secondary mm -hmm. school student. You have written uh, that. Um, there was actually punishment of students who spoke their language. Tell me, at the time this was happening, uh, did you have any disquiet at that point, or were you of the mind indeed that perhaps you were being civilized into English? No, of course, <laughs> be very frank, you don't like being beaten for any reason. <laughs> Right. Okay. So that aspect was really very bad. Yeah, because they gave you uh, the corporal punishment often on their buttocks or the one who is being uh, uh, punished. Right. 
Uh, but more often they will make you carry a little placard around your neck saying I'm stupid or I'm a donkey. Worse is when they made you swallow something filthy, right? Something filthy is like a piece of dirt, you know, mm. as a punishment for speaking an African language in school compound, okay? Right. Uh, this is what I meant, the negation of the, the language, of, the vilification of the language of the colonized and the, glor uh, the simultaneously glorification of the language of the colonizer. In other words, put it this way, it was not a question of adding English to African languages or French to African languages. No, <laughs> African languages had to die in order for imperial language to live. Okay, that's why I'm saying they are often planted on the graveyard of the languages of colonized. Yeah, glory for imperial language and glory blood for the language of the colonized. You know, so glory, glory. Okay, that was the uh, the problem. The problem in other words was not a question of knowing or adding English to whatever language you had. No, this is not how they did it. It was conditioning, huh? like when you give a dog or any animal. Uh, or experiments which have to be done where you ring a bell and then food appears for the animal, okay? But later, the sound alone will make the animal salivate in anticipation of the food. The sound alone. Mm -hmm. The same conditioning was done to the colonized. So that the sound of English you know, will make someone salivate with intelligent anticipated intelligence of this language or with the glory of this language. Okay? Yeah. And the sound so, and the sound of an African language makes the mouth dry up. <laughs> yeah. So let's speak about the cognitive um dimension of the language question. Um, do you believe that in knowledge production and knowledge circulation in Africa, that the use of European languages like French and English and uh, Portuguese in some places impoverishes the ability of young African students to grasp concepts and ultimately to internalize knowledge of what they are yeah. learning. You can acquire knowledge in any language. But let us look at the cognitive process. Everywhere, anywhere, knowledge begins where, from where one is. Okay. If you are making a journey from, I don't know, from say, from uh, your village in Nigeria to say Kenya, you begin where you are. Or not even, if you're going, if you go to the next town, you don't jump. You begin where you are, and you go on adding. And the more you go further on that road, the more actually you know where you are. Okay, but you must know where you are in order to relate that to the marketplace, to other cities, to other areas. Okay, so a journey everywhere. 
all over the world begins where one is. It's a normal cognitive process, okay? Mm -hmm. Colonialism does it the other way around. It takes the cognitive, the journey, cognitive journey begins in Europe, in pure centers, <laughs> right? Right, so it's uh, like, um, you know, in Africa, there will be a time when if I wanted to go to Lagos from Kenya, from Nairobi, huh? I literally, I'd have to go to London first. They made you fly to London. <laughs> then from London, you take a flight back <laughs> to the continent, to Nigeria in this case, right? But that was also the colonial process. Europe is made to be the imperial center becomes the beginning of the cognitive process and thereafter a distortion of everything for you. Okay. Cognitive process begins where you are. Then you're going adding and subtracting yeah, what I call uh, in a dialectical process of give and take. Okay, you know where you are? Because you know where you are, any step you take forward makes you know you are where you are even better. At the same you need, knowing where you come from, you are able to recognize the differences between where you come from and other places. You can make comparisons all the time, okay? That's a difference that they, they said the cognitive process begins in imperial centers. So uh, I'm, I want to go back to um, your detention in a maximum uh, security prison uh, in this, from December of 1977. Uh, I believe for a, more than a, a little more than a year you were held mm -hmm. in detention. Um, it was in detention that you then wrote, uh, I believe, Devil on the Cross, yeah. uh, your novel. So you wrote it originally uh, in Gikuyu. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you describe the process of the composition of that novel um, and how as somebody, as a writer who is detained for using his language to connect to his Gikuyu people. And here you are in jail, writing a novel now as a way in defiance of those who had jailed you. How, what was that experience? Why was it, how important was it even for the survival of your spirit? Uh, no, in it's, the be very it saved my mental life or it saved me, right? Because what I told myself when I was in, remember I was in my maximum security prison. And for the first three weeks or so, I was in complete isolation. What did, what did they call internal segregation? Meaning that the other, the other political prisoner cannot talk to you. <laughs> you look like, a, well, in the old days when people had le leprosy, people used to run away from them. <laughs> so you get that feeling of, you know, everybody's not running away from because they're not allowed to come near you. Okay? Right. Now, what did writing do to Nigiko do to me? First of all, it was for me an act of resistance, right? In prison, I said to myself, I have been put in this prison for writing in my mother tongue. Right? So now I'm going to use this prison eh, to write in my mother tongue. <laughs> That's my frame of mind. You know, what about I've been put here for writing my mother? What about in a, if I do it now under their surveillance or under their eyes or under their whatever, right? Mm -hmm. That's my frame of mind. It is really help, you know. Any act of resistance is a survival mechanism, right? You know? And for me, writing the novel 
was precisely what saved my life, mental life that is, right? I had something to do. I was in defiance all the time. And interestingly, I was learning a lot because some of the warders or, or prison officers did not really know, did not believe that I was really in because of writing the Koyo. So they had no problem <laughs> discussing a Koyo words with me or proverb or whatever I wanted to ask them, I would ask them and they would have these debates. But ironically, if I asked them about the weather out of the prisons, they would be mom. <laughs> But language, oh, no problem. Proverbs, and then argue. Okay. So, um, and you know, I wrote on toilet paper also was, uh, because we didn't have any paper. Mm. Uh, no radio, no newspapers anyway. So again, I had to devise, how do I do, you know, how do I go about this act of resistance? Toilet paper was the only paper available to me, okay? You know, the whole notion, start where you are. <laughs> where, what was nearest to me? Toilet paper, huh? That's why I use toilet paper to write uh, the, the novel. Uh, my first, yeah. no, I think it's first novel in a co language, actually. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Shaitani Mudarafaini. So, uh, what were the problems that you faced um, at the linguistic level? Since I was not used to writing in Nigikoyo, I was more used to writing in English. So sometimes I would try to find a word in Nigikoyo for a certain concept. I'm struggling. But the little Satan comes and whispers to me, Oh, boogie, eh? why are you English. bothering yourself? I'm here, you know, eh? right? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to struggle with that satanic voice, you know, mm. wearing English clothes or English language, sorry, English language clothes. Saying, I'm ready for you. Why bother? Mm. And and this was I realized later. This was this was a conditioning also of the colonial system. It means it won't be so normalized. What I call normalization of abs normalization of abnormality. Hmm? That abnormality becomes normal, right? Because what's normal, my friends? What's normal? The normal is that you know your language, in your case, it's a Igbo, and you can use it freely for anything. Then you can add many languages to your knowledge of Igbo. You can add English, French, Japanese, or anything, right? That's a normal process. That's normality. But this other one, where well, you cannot use your own language, you cannot, but you can freely if beautiful, use another person's language, especially the language of the imperial master. That's abnormal by any cognitive process, by any, you can, it's abnormal, right? So what we've done in Africa is we normalized the abnormality of the colonial system. Mm. Is clearer in language than anything else, you know. Even writers, intellectuals of Africa, have become prisoners of the abnormality. We dwell <laughs> with normalized abnormality, right? That's what we are today. And if you ask me, the problem with Africa is this: <laughs> you can't build a society on normalized abnormality. Because abnormality is still not, even if you normalize it, it's still abnormal. Yes. Yeah. So, so to, to go back to this, that experience that led to your incarceration, um, where you 
and a few of your colleagues uh, decide to uh, do a theatrical, uh, a theatrical production uh, mm -hmm. with peasants and workers in a community. And this invites uh, the fury of the government uh, to shut down the theater and then to put you in jail. It seems to me that also uh, what is at, at play here is that usually academia of what we call the ivory tower is often at a remove from the vital lives of the community um, of their people, you know, so that there's that kind of that education, especially uh, in colonized spaces like Kenya, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and so on creates this alienation uh, between the educated elite and the people uh, out of uh, that they have um, come from. And so that when you began to do this theater and began to use, as you've described wonderfully, began to use the peasants themselves as the, uh, as the actors, as the, um, mm -hmm. as the, to, inc to integrate them into this whole experience. Uh, do you think that that was part of the, um, part of what left the government uneasy, this collaboration of highly educated people with peasants and the masses? Personally, okay. Again, I come to the question of language. Because as I said earlier, I'd published very critical uh, novels. We are really very critical of the post-colonial condition in Kenya, right? In a grain of wheat, in petals of blood, especially. And I mentioned earlier, Michelle and I wrote the play, uh, the trial of Leren Kimari, again, consistently critical of the post-colonial condition. Except for police questioning here and there, nothing happened to me then. The moment I write the play or participate in the play in the Koyo language, uh, I get in problem. But it's not a coil by itself. It's also, of course, what the play was talking about. Right? It's a combination of what the play was talking about and the fact that it was talking about it mm -hmm. in a language that the community could follow and understand. Right? A, a, a post colonial regime would have no problem <laughs> if you wrote a play which was in, a, in any African language which was praising the regime. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah, oh, it was, yeah, it's very fine. Yeah. So it's a combination of the content and the form. The medium. Yeah, the medium, the language medium. And therefore, the question of audience comes in. Hmm? You're writing a play in Koyo, which also reflected the lives of that community. And therefore, the community could identify with the concerns of the play, right? And remember, remember the irony in my case, you know, I was put in maximum security prisoner under the first president of Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta. And Jomo Kenyatta was very, very interesting. Because he was, remember, he was the founder. He was the founding editor of the first ever Koyo language newspaper way back in the 1920s. Right? And that in itself then was really almost a revolutionary act <laughs> in the 20s. Producer and it's in a in a mother in an African language, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are a couple of other 
So in your 1987 book, Decolonizing mm -hmm. the Mind, The Politics of Language in African Literature, uh, that's where you make the formal announcement of uh, that you are uh, you were going to do your uh, for the future uh, creative works and uh, in Kikuyu and uh, perhaps in Kishwahili. Um, in that book, you invite or you engage in a debate with certain African writers. Um, and I think that primarily you take on Chinua Achebe's position. Uh, and his position had been that he had been given uh, the English language and that he had, in a sense, domesticated the language um, to carry his Igbo experience. Uh, tell me why that is not uh, a persuasive argument. Now, and I come back to this question once again. the normalization of a foreign language or color language as the language of the people. Now, so much, you had, so you get African people react to this in different ways. Hmm? One, of course, you say, no, I can get this language and I can turn it upside down. I can go into it and put revolutionary things, subvert it, huh? or I can bend it to my will. And my opposing was, no, you're not bending to your will. You're just showing the capacities of English or French. And guess what? In Ireland, uh, it you have the same argument. Huh? You say, no, we can use English to express our Irishness, okay? <laughs> but Yeats is now better known as an English writer than he is known as an Irish writer because he was never an Irish writer. So is James Joyce. He's Irish by blood, but he was never Irish as far as uh, Irish language is concerned. The same thing with African writers. I know African writers in general have done great. I mean, they are very important artistic works. So I'm not talking about their talent or their abilities. Uh, Things Fall Apart is a great novel by any standards, okay? Yeah. So I'm not talking about the, whether African can write greater works in English or not. <laughs> I'm talking about the relationship between you thinking that I can go and do great things in that other language, <laughs> but nothing from for my language. I can take my language and enrich the other language but I cannot take from the other language and enrich my language. That's a bonomality I'm talking about. What, what makes this your duty as an African writer or intellectual? That you can take proverbs from your community in order to go and enrich English language or think that you can somehow bend English to your will. And there's nothing wrong with that. Why leave your own language in you know, order to wrestle with the other? Right? This abnormality. It's never been the question whether African people can use English or French or not. They have done that beautifully. Yeah. I don't think this fall apart is a great novel by any standards. Right? All money or African producers get to work in. But what about African languages, the ones which are spoken by the majority of people in whatever we come from? 